Hamas executed six Israeli hostages. But you wouldn't know it if you listen to the Israeli media, because since the morning, both the media and Israel's political leaders on the left have been accusing Prime Minister Netanyahu of responsibility for their murder. Everything today is on the line, and the left has decided that the only enemy worth fighting is Prime Minister Netanyahu. I'll have all of the details coming up on In Focus. On Friday night, after a lovely Shabbat dinner at my home, uh, we were relaxing, and all of a sudden we heard this large bomb go off. We didn't see any information. We weren't on our phones. We weren't quite sure what to do. Nobody was saying anything. There were no air raid sirens. And so we figured, well, maybe it was, uh, maybe it was Iron Dome intercepting a... Um, an incoming missile from somewhere or another, and uh, they just hadn't had a chance to operate the air raid sirens or something like that. And then uh, one of my sons heard a second boom, which we didn't hear. Anyway, we waited uh, until uh, Saturday night to discover that what had actually happened was that there was a double car bombing in Gush Etzion, where we live, not far from where we live. The first bomb went off at the gas station that everybody fills their cars at, um, and uh, the second one went off inside of the community of Karmate Sur, uh, just uh, south of the junction. We're north of there. And uh, we didn't hear that one. My, one of my sons did. And uh, basically, uh, it was a miracle that saved, uh, I don't know how many, untold numbers of Israelis from being murdered. These were two very significant car bombs that were supposed to go off simultaneously. And both of them were intercepted at the last minute by Israeli security forces who saw what was going on or suspected the, the, the uh, cars of being uh, somehow or another a, a threat, and they confronted the drivers, and at the uh, junction by the gas station, um, they killed him after he got out of the car. The car blew up. I, whatever happened, happened. And then in Karmate Sur, uh, he tried to run over the security guard at the entrance to the community on Friday night, and a mobile response or a mobile responder in a security vehicle uh, followed him into the community and was able to ram him and, uh, and got the terrorist uh, rattled. He got out and the uh, security, or he stayed in the, in the car. The car started igniting and the uh, security guard was able to kill him. And both bombs blew up with minimal damage to uh, Israelis, several of the forces at the uh, junction in the first bombing, which is what we heard from our house, and then at Karmate Sur, which was much softer from where we were, um, were lightly injured. But that's it. Now, that bombing took place on Friday night, uh, this morning, Sunday morning. Um, terrorists from Hebron, but those terrorists were from Hebron. Also from Hebron were terrorists who uh, uh, murdered three Israeli policemen at a junction called Tarkumia, which uh, connects the Hebron Hills with the Negev. Um, and they left Hebron in the morning. There was no roadblock because Israel removed the roadblock to please the Americans. More on that later. And um, so without any obstacles to their travel, these terrorists were able to get to the Tarkumia junction and murder three Israeli policemen uh, at around 7 o'clock in the morning. Um, all of these attacks are occurring while the IDF is carrying out a division-sized operation in northern Samaria, uh, particularly in the cities of Janine and Tulkaram, where you have large forces operating. They've been killing a lot of terrorists. They've been blowing up a lot of ordnance, exposing, taking control over a very large number of weapons. And the idea behind this operation is that they go in and then they just sit there and over time, I don't know, the next several weeks, if they're not stopped by U.S. pressure, they're going to start dismantling the massive terror infrastructure that's been built up in these northern Samaria towns over the past uh, while. And the problem is that uh, the forces that we're seeing now, as many of the officers involved in the operation have said, are not the just 
suicide terrorists that we've been seeing or that we saw 20 years ago in the Palestinian terror war that began in the summer or the fall of 2000, actually in September of 2000. Um, those were people who were signed up and they stripped, uh, they strapped explosive belts to their bodies and they just blew up in a group of Israelis. These are highly trained killers. Don't forget that the United States uh, arms and trains the Palestinian Authority security forces uh, in, and they have significant military capabilities and the Palestinian Authority security forces are themselves embedded with a lot of these terror groups, including Hamas and Islamic Jihad and Fatah, all of whom are engaged in active acts of terrorism against Israel. So we're talking about a much more skilled, more professional force of terrorists, much more similar to the Hamas forces that invaded Israel on October 7th and the suicide bombers that we knew beginning 24 years ago this month. So that's where we are right now in terms of uh, the terrorism in Judea and Samaria. In the meantime, in their eyes to the north, everybody anticipates that uh, there's only one way. Everybody understands that there's only one way to return the 80,000 Israelis who were evacuated from their homes after October 7th to prevent them from being, from sharing the fate of the uh, Israelis on the border with Gaza with uh, what was seen as an imminent Hezbollah invasion of Israel at the time with their ground forces, the Radwan brigades uh, that are considered to be Hezbollah's most elite ground forces that have been charged with the goal of overrunning and conquering the Upper Galilee and down to the Western Galilee uh, since 2018 when, the, when their uh, plan was first uh, made public by Hezbollah itself. So uh, the Israelis were removed and it's been obvious really since then that uh, the only way that they're going to be able to go home safely is if Israel conducts a major ground operation in South Lebanon and destroys and removes physically Hezbollah's ground forces uh, from the border and also diminishes significantly Hezbollah's missile and mortar and rocket and drone arsenal that they've been using to such effect with, I think, over 6,000 of the projectiles having already been shot at Israel since uh, October. So, and they have 150,000 or so still in their inventory. So, it's very clear that we're going to have to take care of business in the north, and that requires a major ground invasion of southern, southern Lebanon and pushing back and destroying Hezbollah's ground forces and blowing up uh, the missiles and the drones and et cetera so that they're not shot into Israel at a rate which Hezbollah intended to th shoot them at Israel just a week and a half ago of between 3,000 and 6,000 projectiles a day. Okay, so that's what we're facing in the north. We have massive terrorist threats emanating from Judea and Samaria. We've seen two major attacks just in the past couple of days in Gush Etzion and in South Hebron Hills at Tarkumi, Jun Tarkumi uh, Junction. One, miraculously, didn't end with mass casualties among Israelis, and one, unfortunately, ended with three Israeli policemen dead. Um, and then we have this operation in northern Samaria. We have Lebanon, and obviously we have Gaza. So in Gaza, um, last week, uh, Israeli forces, in a bit of a strange operation, uh, were operating uh, in Rafiach, and they discovered a tunnel uh, where they found an Israeli Bedouin who was hostage, and he was by himself, and uh, his captors had abandoned him alive. Uh, and uh, he was saved by Israeli forces. And the IDF forces have been operating have been seeking to uncover what's going on in a very large tunnel complex that they found uh, the released hostage in and or the the rescued hostage in and um, it works out that there were six other hostages being held in that tunnel and those hostages of course uh, uh, tragically include both American Israeli hostage Hirsch Goldberg Poland and also who's 23 uh, Carmel Gott, who's from, uh, she actually is from Tel Aviv, but she was visiting her parents at Kibbutz Be'eri, where she grew up. She's 39 years old. She was not released as expected in the uh, hostage swap in November. She was left in custody, uh, and she was murdered. Uh, Eden Yerushalmi, 24, uh, she was abducted from the Nova Festival. Um, she was murdered. Amok Sarusi, 
uh, 26. He uh, was at the Nova Festival with his girlfriend who was shot and he didn't run away, he was staying with her and she died and he was uh, taken hostage. And 32-year-old Alex uh, Lubanov and 25-year-old Ori Danino, who actually had gone down to the uh, Nova Festival to try to save his friends who were taken hostage, and he also was taken hostage. So they were all executed, and their bodies were uh, found uh, and brought back to Israel on Saturday night. And so sometime between, uh, during the evening on Saturday night and Sunday morning, the uh, story got out that they had been executed, that they were murdered. Um, Hamas was the one, again, that murdered them, not anybody else. It was Hamas, their captors, murdered them. And the question is, you know, why, why would Hamas execute them instead of just abandoning them the way that they uh, abandoned uh, Farcan, uh, uh, Farcan? And the answer is because uh, it had quite the effect in Israel to receive their bodies back. Uh, what happened was that uh, rather than call for Israel, for instance, to execute the Hamas terrorists uh, who we picked up on October 7th who have confessed their role in the atrocities, which are all crimes against humanity and crimes under the Genocide Convention that uh, make them liable for the death penalty, uh, rather than call for them to be executed, at least six of them, if not more, um, the opposition, as I said at the outset, are calling for Netanyahu's head. Uh, we've had calls throughout the day uh, and last night and really beginning uh, um, several days ago uh, for people to come onto the streets, uh, for them to overthrow the government, for them to riot, for them to paralyze the country, for the, us to be subjected to demonstrations that will shake the country to its foundations and force the government from power because the government, led by Prime Minister Netanyahu, rather than Hamas, is responsible for the murder of the six and before that for the continued captivity of all Israeli hostages in Gaza, not Hamas, which is holding them. So I want to I wanna place what we're seeing. I just wrote a column about it. You should read it on, uh, on JNS. It's called uh, Hamas' Israeli Collaborators. Okay? Um, I, I talked about this at length in my column, and I'm not going to go through the entire column because I think it's very important to explain where we are and how it fits into the larger picture of what the, le what the left in Israel, the politicians, the retired generals, the sitting generals who are acting as opposition to the government from their positions as chief of staff of the IDF in the case of Herzia Levy, in the case of Hedda, director of the Shin Bet, in the case of Ronan Barr, and many of their underlings, and at times, from time to time, also David Barnad, the Mossad director, um, they're all acting in unison in a way that essentially places the blame and the responsibility for the fate of the hostages not on Hamas, but on Netanyahu. And, um, and then the left on the streets, the left in the Knesset, the left in the media, um, the retired generals who make up one of the hardcore and most extreme uh, factions of the left that's been leading riots against the government uh, since its inception in November of 2022, and even before that, it has have been leading, have played really leading roles in attempting to oust Netanyahu from power beginning back in 2018. Um, they have all latched onto uh, the positions that are being communicated to uh, media outlets by the security brass to blame Netanyahu, to blame the government, to use the plight of the hostages, including the execution of the six, apparently uh, in recent days, um, as a means to oust the government from power, as a means to justify their calls for the immediate ouster of the government from power uh, through mob action, through general strikes, through um, blocking of highways, through shutting down of businesses, through a general strike of the economy. You have the same high-tech uh, billionaires who were participating in the anti-government riots in the 10 months preceding the Hamas invasion who are answering the calls saying that their employees should uh, participate. You have, this, you have the leading business uh, owners in Israel, private business owners, saying that they would be willing to 
support a national strike. You have the head of the Histadrut main labor union in Israel meeting with families of what's called the hostage families forums, which represents a very small fraction of the hostage families, but they get all of the bandwidth because they are part of this leftist complex to bring down the government. Uh, and uh, the assessment that I read earlier today is that uh, in this meeting, the Histadrut uh, chief is going to respond favorably to the request for a general strike of the economy in order to force Netanyahu to do what? To capitulate to Hamas's demands for a total uh, withdrawal of all idea forces from Gaza, including from the all-important, uh, from a strategic perspective, international border that connects Gaza to Egypt, um, and, um, and withdraw all idea forces in order to receive a fraction of the, ter of the hostages that are being held. So now, after they murdered six, uh, we have, and, and Qadi uh, was let out, Farhan was left out, was, let, was rescued, um, we have about 100, I think we have 101 hostages left, about 40 of them, if not more, are assumed dead. So we're talking about out of 80, you get 20, so you're leaving 60, presumably live hostages behind. Um, and Hamas, in the meantime, hasn't agreed to any deal. They make these demands. They refuse to give the identities of the hostages that they're willing to free. They refuse to say which hostages are alive. They refuse to give any reports on the status of any of the hostages. Obviously, none of them are getting medical treatment. And what we already know from hostages who have been rescued, um, they're systematically starved, tortured, raped. Um, and humiliated, right, and subjected to psychological torture day in and day out, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, by these Hamas terrorists who are holding them. And, of course, we know that many of them have already been executed by Hamas deliberately while in captivity for whatever reason. Okay, so this is all Hamas is doing. They invaded. They took 256 hostages, right? They've been torturing them. But, but the left's response to all of this is to tell Israel not double down. We can't afford this to ever happen again. Let's destroy these people. It's capitulate and the war now. And when the government refuses to do so, blame the government for the continued captivity, even though Hamas has never offered to let them all out. And it never will, because from its perspective, the hostages are an ace in the hole, so there are no real negotiations. Hamas's demands mean an Israeli catastrophic defeat in this war. Um, and Hamas isn't even at the table. They've been on again, off again, uh, just um, boycotting the negotiations. And the two supposed mediators that are supposedly communicating with Hamas and supposed to be pressuring Hamas, Qatar, Qatar and Egypt are doing no such thing. They are not they are not pressuring Hamas at all. They are not placing any pressure on Hamas at all to change its positions one iota. So you have this really weird situation brewing where the only side in the negotiations is actually Israel. The only side that's being pressured to change its positions to make concessions is Israel. Hamas is not being pressured by anybody, and Hamas isn't even at the negotiations. Their position hasn't changed since October 7th. They want a total Israeli capitulation. They want hundreds, if not thousands, of Hamas terrorists to be freed from Israeli prisons. And those terrorists, according to reports from the prisons authority, are already organizing themselves for how they're going to rebuild, how they're going to uh, restore Hamas control over Gaza and take control over Judea and Samaria and liberate Israel from within among Israeli Arab society as well the minute that they're let out. So they're already planning. Moreover, if Israel leaves, as I discussed last week, if Israel actually were to capitulate and leave the international border between uh, Gaza and Egypt, we have thousands of Hamas terrorists armed and waiting for Israel to remove itself from the international border so that they can go back in and immediately rebuild Hamas's depleted forces in Gaza. So it, 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 from a strategic perspective, it makes absolutely no sense. And all the same, we have the left saying capitulate, including our general staff uh, generals led by Herzl Levy and the Shin Bed led by Ronan Barr. 
They're saying, oh, no, we can do this. We can temporarily withdraw IDF forces from the border zone without any problem. And they keep saying that we'll go back after six weeks. But what's the problem? So the, 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 the deal that the Biden-Harris administration has put forward is talking about staged, a staged agreement and that those 20 or 30 hostages whose names we don't know, whose position in terms of being alive or dead, we, Hamas won't reveal, they're supposed to be released over a period of six weeks. Israel is supposed to remove its forces, have a ceasefire in place from Gaza, from whatever areas of Gaza are agreed upon. And, um, and Hamas is supposed to, and, and Israel is supposed to let out, in some cases, like for the female terrorists, 150 uh, murderers a day in exchange for each uh, of, the, of the five female uh, soldiers that uh, Hamas is holding hostage. Um, so we're talking about letting out massive numbers of murderers, of arch terrorists who are in Israeli jails out for each Israeli, ter uh, each Israeli hostage. We're talking about uh, removing IDF forces. And so that's stage one. It's supposed to last six weeks. And then there's supposed to be a stage two and a stage three where the ceasefire is supposed to remain in place or be reinstated or something, and there's supposed to be some sort of discussion about the disposition of the remaining hostages in Gaza and how much Israel's gonna give for each of the hostages dead and alive. So the problem is, of course, that if Israel, is the problem is, is stage one gonna end? Like, can't, if, if Hamas, if there's nothing to negotiate, if Hamas isn't negotiating in good faith, which of course it isn't doing now, but so assuming that it continues its practice and it's not negotiating in good faith, or it stops releasing hostages or whatever it is, is it really allowed to reinstate its hostilities? And, you know, sort of formally, uh, the Americans say, yeah, but that's not the American position, and we know that, because Kamala Harris says repeatedly that they want to get a permanent ceasefire. They want a ceasefire. They want a hostage deal and a ceasefire agreement. The ceasefire agreement is supposed to be in place as quickly as possible, and it's certainly supposed to last until the presidential election and after. But the Americans have no intention of truly backing an Israeli resumption of hostilities, uh, assuming, as is the reasonable assumption, Hamas doesn't abide by the agreement. So the, the promise of Israel's military leadership that we can just go back to the border zone between Gaza and Egypt is a total lie. It's based on a deliberate mischaracterization of the American position. And this isn't a character, and we you know it's possible that Jake Sullivan says certain things. It's, the you know, CIA director uh, says certain things. It's possible all kinds of things are being said in closed room, but the fact is that the political realities dictate an American policy of not supporting a resumption of hostilities by Israel if Hamas breaks its word, which of course it will because it's Hamas. So that means that an Israeli withdrawal from Philadelphia, which is what the Gaza, <clears throat> the Gaza Egyptian border is called, the Philadelphia corridor, because it was once named that on some map. At any rate. Israel's ability, Israel's freedom to go back and retake that border zone is, is essentially non-existent. And yet they're lying and they're saying it's fine and it's not. So they're putting forward this idea that it'll only be for six weeks. And what are you going to do with the thousands of forces that immediately enter into Gaza through tunnels or through whatever means they do through, through the Rafa terminal? Why well, are you going to stop that? Well, you're in the middle of a ceasefire. If you stop the ceasefire to kill them at the border, well, then we're not getting our hostages back. So we've destroyed the hostage shield. So we're responsible for the destruction of the hostage shield. You see how this works? If Hamas executes six hostages and Prime Minister Netanyahu is accused of being responsible for their murder because he's not capitulating to Hamas's demands, then what's going to happen when they breach the ceasefire before any of the hostages or the bulk of the hostages or the hostages that are most precious to Israel, our soldiers, are returned? What happens then? Well, it, how is Israel going to reinstate hostilities then? Because everybody's waiting for them to come home. What's going to happen to them? Are they going to be executed? And that brings us, you know, to what actually happened. So Yoav Gallant, the defense minister, he's, he had an uncoordinated week-long uh, visit, uncoordinated with the prime minister, week-long visit in, the, in Washington in late June. And uh, he met with all the who's who in Washington. And he came back. And, you know, this is a guy who is always the weakest link in the government chain in terms of always 
uh, being more on the side of the opposition than than the government and everything from its earliest days, whether it was about the uh, uh, about the legal reform or the conduct of this war or the uh, positions of the general staff on a whole host of issues, including uh, protecting Israelis in Judea and Samaria and standing up to American pressure there. He's always been much more on the left than on the right. And in fact, he's been an instigator of a lot of the chaos by standing with the left and destabilizing the government constantly uh, since the earliest, his earliest days in office. But after he came back from the United States in late June, uh, he sort of abandoned the pretense that he shared Netanyahu's uh, absolute devotion to the goal of total victory in this war. And he started increasingly loudly calling for Israel to succumb to Hamas's demands, even though Hamas's demands are total Israeli capitulation, and insisting that the prime minister is lying to the public when he says that we can't. We can't leave the border with Gaza. We can't uh, let all of these, these, uh, these terrorists out of prison without endangering our country. We can't delay operating in the north for too long. We can't accept a diplomatic deal with Hezbollah that's going to leave them uh, in a position to attack us at will. We can't do any of these things, right? Uh, he keeps saying we can. He keeps taking the positions of the left on all of these critical issues. So he's taken the, 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 the American and the left's position on supporting an Israeli capitulation to Hamas's demands at the negotiating table or non-negotiating table in places like Cairo and Doha, Qatar, where all of these sterile talks have been carried out since, I don't know, uh, the spring at least, uh, by the Americans insisting on in getting a ceasefire because of the elections. Okay, so um, despite the fact that that means that Hamas wins and Israel loses. So on Thursday night, so, so first of all, Netanyahu has said all along, we're not leaving Philadelphia. We're not leaving the border zone. This is an absolute no. We're not going to do it. I refuse to do it under any circumstances because we didn't get this far in order to capitulate to all of Hamas's demands and lose the war. Right? And this is a position that's broadly supported by the public. Direct polls polled this issue at the beginning of August, and two-thirds of Israelis supported Netanyahu's positions, okay? including not leaving hostages behind in stage one, which is, of course, the one stage. Anyway, so he, his position is broadly supported by the public. And he made it, and he's stood on it. This is what he's standing on. And so Gallant is going ballistic. Thursday, Netanyahu, and, and there are all of these talks in Cairo, in Doha, and they're leading nowhere because Hamas keeps rejecting America's proposals. And America's proposals keep getting better and better for Hamas. Hamas rejects them, because why shouldn't it? All of the pressure is being brought to bear, both domestic Israeli pressure and external pressure, on his enemy, on Israel, to capitulate. And all he needs to win is to survive. Israel needs to obliterate him in order to win, obliterate Hamas and seize and maintain control over Hamas, the international, I mean, Gaza, the international border and all of Gaza in order to win. All he has to do is survive. And with domestic, Amer uh, domestic Israeli pressure, American pressure being brought to bear on the government, he thinks that the first side to cry uncle is Israel. So we had this remarkable security cabinet meeting that convened on Thursday. And uh, it was supposed to deal with a lot of different issues. One of those issues is the status of the ceasefire talks, the status of the hostage negotiations. And Gallant came into this meeting, and all of this was leaked by him. He came into this meeting and he said, listen, uh, we have to agree to Hamas's demands. Otherwise, the hostages are going to be killed. Literally, that's what he said. How do we know? Because he leaked his own statements to the media. All right. This was a meeting. It went on for seven hours. It ended at four o'clock in the morning. OK, this is crazy. And it's because he had a meltdown. And then he was in real time. And then after it was over, he kept leaking it to Yaron Avraham, this political correspondent on the radically anti-Israel Channel 12, uh, Israeli television station. So he, all of this stuff is getting leaked in real time. So Gallant says to the security cabinet, uh, look, we have to capitulate. And then Netanyahu says, I will not give in to Hamas's demands. I'm not going to take anybody's dictates. And then he says, then he says, well, uh, you know, then, then all of that, then the hostages are going to be killed. In other words, it's your fault, Prime Minister Netanyahu, if the hostages are killed. In fact, and so Netanyahu came back and said, you know, here are the maps. 
of where we need to stay in the Philadelphia corridor. This is where, this is the position of the Israeli negotiating team that Israel has to remain on the Philadelphia corridor forever and we're never leaving, not temporarily, not ever, okay? And he asked the cabinet, he showed the maps, he asked the cabinet to pass a decision making this the official position of the security cabinet of the Israeli government so that it's legally binding on Israel going forward, okay? So that nobody can move from this position. And Gallant threw, uh, threw a fit. And he said, these are only the maps because you made them the maps. The generals wanted different maps. You rejected them. Like, yeah, so who's the prime minister in this story, right? Netanyahu, is, he's totally within his rights. If they want to capitulate to Hamas, that's their business. He doesn't. And he's the leader of the country. And so if he changed their maps, that's fine. So they go to Cairo or to Doha with maps they don't like. Well, what are you going to do? That's why they're not in charge. That's why nobody voted them into office, right? Because they were appointed true, albeit by the previous government, and they hate Netanyahu as much as the political opposition, and they're not making any attempt to hide that fact, and they, in fact, have acted in subversive ways throughout his tenure since he returned to office in January, in December of 2020, 2022. All the same, it's not their decision to make. So he gave them this maps. He said, these are the maps that you can present. This is what we're willing to do. This is what we're not willing to do. So he says to the cabinet, I want a decision that says this is our official position as a government of Israel. And uh, Gallant freaks out, says, you're all going to, you know, Netanyahu's, uh, he can just as easily order a government decision calling for the murder of the hostages. And this is the defense minister of Israel accusing the prime minister of Israel of deliberately murdering the hostages by saying that Israel can't capitulate at the Gaza-Egypt border because capitulation will essentially guarantees that Israel loses this war uh, in, in the worst way possible. All right. So he's saying that if we don't surrender, we're going to kill the hostages. We're going to kill the hostages, not Hamas. And then we find out. So this dominates the airwaves uh, from early Friday morning through Saturday night. And then Saturday night, lo and behold, we get the news that the six hostages were executed, that they were executed, and they were, their bodies were found by IDF forces. So what did Sinwar hear? Sinwar heard that if he kills the hostages, the Israeli left, following the lead of the defense minister of Israel, supported by the chief of general staff who refuses to resign, even though he's responsible for October 7th, and the director of Shin Bet who refuses to resign, even though he's perhaps, you know, he and Herzl Levy, but he in particular, because he was responsible for intelligence assessments and operational readiness on the Gaza border, is responsible for October 7th. They're all saying, together with Gallant, that Netanyahu is effectively holding the hostages that he's ordering their murder, right? So what did Sinwar hear? He heard that if he kills them, that he's going to cause massive political unrest in Israel, which obviously advances his interests of forcing Israel to capitulate, because that's what he wants. He wants Americans to pressure Israel, and he wants any Israeli who is determined to fight to be overthrown in power, you know, and to be disenfranchised if he's a voter. That's what he wants, because he wants Israeli capitulation, because he wants genocide. He wants to annihilate Israel. And he knows with absolute certainty that if Israel capitulates on the issue of the hostage talks, then we will face a certain genocide, as we're seeing, you know, in Gush Etzion, as we're seeing in the South Hebron Hills, as we're seeing in, in Syria, as we're seeing in Lebanon, as we're seeing uh, in Iraq, as we're seeing in Yemen, you know, and as we're continuing to see in Gaza with the hostages and, and in general in the assault, continued assault on our, on, our, on our soldiers, if not by organized units of Hamas terrorists and by terrorist guerrilla forces that are, you know, coming out of uh, tunnel entrances and blowing up or putting down IEDs where they're operating in order to blow them up and all kinds of other things that cause us to lose. I think 10, 10 soldiers over the past uh, week and a half. The latest one was just killed yesterday, this one in Janine. So we're looking at a situation where, you know, we cannot, we cannot capitulate. There's simply no way, there's no deal to be made. Any deal that we make is going to empower them to attack us even more. 
It's going to empower them to assault us. And we're going to be afraid society because the reason why we capitulated in the first place, the reason why we would capitulate is because of domestic political unrest. So that's what we're facing right now. And the person that is steering this wheel is a defense minister who is sitting in the security cabinet, who is a full member of what's going on. And now why isn't he being fired? He's not being fired because we see where all of this is leading. We have a left that is on fire, that is completely devoted to only one thing, the same thing that they've been devoted to since 2015, which is the overthrow of Prime Minister Netanyahu from power. That's it. That, you know, everybody responded. I saw Yotam Zimri, who was a, who was a very, very bright and really good at snark commentator in, on the radio and television in Israel. And he said, everybody responded to the execution of the hostages by pointing a finger at his one true enemy. And in the case of the left, they have only one true enemy, and that's Netanyahu. He's responsible for everything bad that happens in Israel. But when we look at the overall story of what the left is doing, we see that they really have lost contact with the mothership. You know, this has been going on, and we chronicled it, and we're going to have to go back to it, unfortunately. In the 10 months that preceded October 7th, you know, they they fought the government tooth and nail. They brought Israel to the brink of, or actually perhaps into a civil war um, to block uh, the 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 passage of legislation that would have placed limited checks and balances on the power of the judicial system of the judiciary of the Supreme Court, which arrogated to itself all the executive, effectively all executive and legislative powers in Israel by giving itself unlimited oversight over the actions of the government and the Knesset and the ability to abrogate laws and government policies that it doesn't like based on nothing more than the personal opinions of self-selected uh, justices of the Supreme Court who are almost entirely aligned with the radical left of Israel. This is this is what happened. And so, you know, and the army's general staff said on a number of occasions that they stood with the justices against the elected government of Israel. And and I and the question is why are they doing this? Why why can't they see the dangers? Now, I think they see the dangers to themselves. I think that that's what happened. Last week, um uh, retired uh, inspector general or whatever, he's like the equivalent of a colonel's rank in Israel's police, named Avi Weiss, gave, he's been exposing a lot of the documents, a lot of the data about what happened on October 7th and about, you know, previously about uh, uh, illegal operations by Israel's uh, legal apparatus against uh, politicians. And what he exposed last week was arguably his most explosive expose to date. Avi Weiss, in an interview with uh, the TOV, T-O-V, internet channel that does a lot of podcasts, I do a lot of podcasts with them, uh, he told his interviewer that on October 7th, essentially, the reason why it took the, the, the reason why the IAF, the Israel Air Force, didn't bomb the Hamas terrorists as they were coming in or, blo- or block the cars from leaving Israel with the hostages and, and, and killing the terrorists instead or block the terrorists from returning to Israel, etc., or giving chase to them inside of Gaza, is because the Attorney General, Ghali Barav Miara, uh, told Prime Minister Netanyahu that he didn't have the power to change the rules of engagement, that he could, didn't have the power to declare war, that only uh, the, full, the full government has the power to declare war, and as a result, until the full cabinet was able to come in uh, to convene at 8 o'clock in the evening and declare war, she refused to allow the IDF to change the rules of engagement, to allow the Israel Air Force to operate, uh, and refused to allow the prime minister to order them to do that. And so the military advocate general in the army, uh, they view themselves as subordinate not to the government but to the attorney general. And so all the lawyers who showed up on October 7th to direct the fire under law uh, blocked any effective action, particularly of the Air Force, uh, from taking place. And so she personally and every IDF general that listened to her instead of Netanyahu that day uh, is responsible uh, for the success of Hamas's uh, operation. I mean, that's the implication. So that's that's devastating. What he what he exposed was simply devastating 
for Herzer Levy, for uh, for the Air Force, for intelligence, for uh, Southern Command, for everybody, partic partic but particularly for the Air Force, because they were the main force that simply didn't show up on October 7th. And it's because it works out. They were obeying the orders, not of the Prime Minister of Israel, who came in front of the cameras personally at 11 o'clock in the morning and declared war. They were told to ignore what he said and obey only the attorney general, which they did. So these people are responsible for what happened. We already saw that we had all the intelligence on what Hamas was planning, but the people who were responsible for assessing the intelligence, particularly our own Khaliwa and his underlings in the Israel Intelligence Corps, Edwin and Barr at the Shin Bet, refused to accept the implications of Hamas's preparations for war, their war plans, their, their actual documents setting out, which Israel got a hold of, setting out their plan for how they were going to overrun southern Israel, how they were going to take hostages, how they were going to massacre, etc. They said it was all fantasies. It would never happen. All we had to do was give Hamas a lot of money and allow Gazans to come into Israel to work, and everything would be fine, and they would remain deterred. So in order you know, to continue to pay them extortion, and then they wouldn't slaughter us. And so they never shared the reports the information about Hamas's intentions, its training, anything, its operations with Prime Minister Netanyahu. He didn't know. He was driving blind on October 7th and in the days previous to the invasion because the army hid it from him. He didn't know. And it was all their fault, but it works that on October 7th themselves when it already happened and he found out what was going on, they didn't obey his orders. They obeyed the orders of the legal fraternity. So that's what we discovered last week. And the longer the war goes on, the more we learn about what they did. And they don't control a commission of inquiry because it hasn't been convened. And, this, and the claim that you can't have an official, uh, you can't have an official commission of inquiry because it's controlled by the legal system that's responsible for what happened uh, becomes much more powerful because the more the public recognizes the culpability of Israel's legal fraternity and our generals for what happened and the lack of culpability of our political leaders who are kept in the dark about everything by this disobedient, deeply subversive uh, a ruling class of self-appointed, largely Israeli top officials, um, the less power they have to determine the outcome of a commission, the less power they have to maintain their position and privilege in Israeli society because the public is learning more and more about the devastating implications of that power and privilege on Israel's national security. So they want to bring the war to a close as quickly as possible and control the discourse on who gets to investigate whom when it's over uh, in order to place all the blame on the people who arguably are the least to blame, who are Israel's elected leaders, whom they kept in the dark and whose orders they disobeyed openly on October 7th. So you see this kind of rush to the exits, even at the expense of a strategic defeat of Israel in a war that by all accounts, well, not by their accounts, but by the public's assessment, is a war for Israel's national survival. You see that it's all part of a determined effort to maintain their position in Israeli power, in Israeli society, in power in Israeli society, whether it's the generals or the legal fraternity, by pushing for an Israeli capitulation. That obviously is also aligned with the interests of the Democratic Party, which is, you know, and the Harris, the Harris campaign, because they want quiet here. They want to use extortionate demands against Israel to force Israel to capitulate to Hamas. And really the only person standing in their way is Prime Minister Netanyahu and his ministers who keep saying we have to keep fighting. So they have to be ousted from power. So you see this unbelievable commonality of interests here of the left and Hamas. And as a result, it's our leaders who are being blamed for Hamas's crimes against humanity, including the execution of six hostages in captivity. This is obviously something that, you know, can't go on. But it does keep going on. It keeps going on. It never gets anywhere, and that's the good thing here. 
And so why doesn't Netanyahu fire Gallant? Because they will light the country on fire, and you will have a lot more dissent. I actually am getting the sense that Gallant, I mean, he was so out of control on Thursday night, he may very well, you know, and then he opened on, on uh, Sunday morning with, a, <clears throat> with an ex post demanding that the government respond to the execution, again, not by killing Hamas terrorists who are in our custody, who have confessed to crimes against humanity that make them culpable for the death penalty, right? Um, no, not by saying that, not by saying we have to fight to absolute victory, we can't give any quarter to these murderers, no, by saying that the only response that we can have to the execution of these six hostages by Hamas is to overturn, to cancel the cabinet's decision on Thursday night, which she so objected to, to maintain Israel's force in control over the Hamas border with Egypt in perpetuity. In other words, Israel's determination not to lose the war. That's his, that's his response. So when I look at that, I think maybe it's more likely that he will resign than that Netanyahu fires him, because if Netanyahu is firing him, then Netanyahu is essentially telling the left, you know, yeah, uh, bring down the economy. Yeah, you know, uh, uh, destroy the, you know, they're already on strike in the high schools. Uh, the school year opened today, but only from first through ninth grade, 10 through 12th is not allowed to go to school. Why? Reasons for the head of the uh, the uh, teachers union, whatever. And so because it's it's bad for the government to not have 10th through 12th graders in, in school. So you know, we have these situations, right, which are being pushed forward in order to destabilize the government. And and it seems like, you know, the only grown-up in this room, whether it's in the room determining the negotiating positions of Israel or how Israel should respond to the executions or what we should do in the face of massive American pressure to capitulate to Hamas or looking at what's happening in Judea and Samaria and Lebanon and our relations uh, with, with Israeli Arabs and so on and so forth, the only one who's keeping his head is the prime minister. So obviously he's the chief culprit, not Hamas, and he's the one who has to pay uh, with his regime, essentially with his government op being overthrown, not Yahya Sinwar, who ordered the execution of our hostages, who ordered October 7th, who is maintaining this genocidal war against Israel and is operating as the proxy of Iran in its seven-front war against Israel in Gaza. So, you know, this is a terrible situation we find ourselves in. You never think that when you're in a war for your national survival that there'll be keen notes in your society that are actually not with you in this battle, but actually are remaining in their own little political battle for power in your country. But that's the situation that Israel finds itself in today. There are no easy ways to solve this problem because if the left will come to terms with reality, you're not going to put you know them all in jail. Yeah, it, it it's too big of a problem to handle, which means that either they come to their senses or we just have to keep plotting on and fighting with this constant domestic unrest that's being fueled by these incredibly irresponsible selfish, narcissistic people on the left who cannot see the national interest because from their perspective, the only thing that's important is for them to have, maintain power, and keep everybody else away from any decision-making uh, powers, first and foremost, the Prime Minister of Israel. So this is where we stand today. It's a tragic time in Israel. It's a tragic moment in Israeli history. It's a pivotal moment in Israeli history, and all we can do is keep going on, keep fighting, keep telling the truth, and keep standing up to bullies who try to block us from moving forward. Anyway, those are my thoughts. I'll have more on their legal operations, including the American and the left's legal operations against uh, our warfighters and others uh, in an interview uh, later this week uh, with a lawyer who's on the front, front lines of trying to fight that uh, coming up. But in the meantime, take care, and I'll see you later this week.